Assalamu alaikum. Thank you very much for joining us once again on our journey of Hajj with uh, Sheikh Dr. Osama Al Atar. Um, Sheikh, when we are preparing to leave this uh, beautiful city of Medina, uh, there is this grief we are feeling. And particularly when we go and visit uh, Lady Fatima, you can just feel her presence and her grief. Um, why do you think is there so much uh, special feelings that we have towards this lady? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah rabbil alameen, wa sallallahu ala muhammadin wa alihi al-tahirin. This noble lady was the soul of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi. As he himself, he says, Fatima is a part of me and she is the soul that's within my body. And it's interesting that he's given this word to her because whatever the Prophet says, it is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We as fathers or as parents, we tell our children, I love you, you're like my heart, you're my soul. But Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi is not just speaking because he's a father and just with the tone of compassion. Whatever he says, in addition to it, of course, being a father and of course being the, the tone of love and compassion, but it is also a revelation from Allah. Allah says he does not speak of desire. It is but a revelation from him. From her inception, you know, from her, even before her birth, the Prophet ﷺ was ordered to leave Khadija عليها, for 40 days, praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, worshiping Allah, fasting for 40 days, and on the last day, breaking his fast with the fruit of Jannah. After then, he was told to go and see his wife Khadija for after missing her for 40 days, and that's how Fatima Salam Allah was conceived. We know even from the materialistic and the spiritualistic sense that food plays a role on our souls, on our spirits. When the Prophet is fasting for 40 days and on the final day he's eating the fruit of Jannah, that will have an impact on this child. And hence the Prophet used to say that Whenever I longed for the fragrance of Jannah, I would smell Fatima Salamullah alayha. When she was in the womb of her mother, sometimes the Prophet used to enter to visit Khadija, he would see her talking to someone. He says, who are you speaking to? She says, the fetus in my womb is talking to me. So from her, prior to even her birth, she was this, you know, extraordinary in all her aspects. And then after her birth, she was a loving daughter. She was born five years after the declaration of the message of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi in Mecca. We call it five years after the ba'tha of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. So when she was a little girl, you know, four or five years old, she would see her father coming home, bleeding, not feeling well. She used to come with her little hands, comfort the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, like a compassionate, loving mother. And hence he used to hug her, kiss her, and he would say, May her father be sacrificed for her. As I mentioned, this is the words of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, the greatest of Allah's creation, saying that may I be sacrificed, fadaha abuha. And then he would call her the mother of her father, ummu abiha. So indeed, she was an extraordinary lady from all aspects. And this is just before even she migrated to Medina. This is the greatness of this noble lady. And uh, these qualities of her, are these ac accepted across the different schools of thought or is it particularly uh, the Shias who give so much more importance to Lady Fatima? No, in fact, uh, the school of thought of Ahlul, uh, of Ahlul Sunnah, or, uh, they, are, they admit the greatness of Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam. They narrate a hadith from uh, Umm al-Mu'mineen Aisha who says that when we used to stitch clothes, we used to stitch on the nur of the face of Fatima Salamullah alayha. We would not need lights. The nur of the face, this is Aisha narrating this hadith about the nur of the face of Fatima. She also Aisha in another hadith says that there was no one who resembled Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wa in his walk, in his character, than closer than Fatima Salamullah alayha. So her eloquence, her greatness, her being the daughter of Rasulullah, the mother of uh, Hassan al Hussein, alayhim as -salam, the children, the only grandchildren of Rasulullah. So you know, they all give high reverence to Fatima al Zahra. Uh, when we come to discuss her greatness, uh, she lived only 18 years in total. 
sometimes it's baffling and it confuses your logic to think that she achieved all this in 18 years. How, how do you justify that? Well, we find that individuals who maybe have some motivation and drive. For example, um, we have cases now of some teenager uh, from a particular Muslim country who was nominated for the Nobel Prize for Peace. And she's a young lady, she's in her teens yet. So people might wonder, well, how could she achieve this? If with her perseverance, dedication, you know, she manages in certain circumstances that worked her way, um, she managed to achieve this. Now, this is an ordinary human being, an ordinary girl, a girl who did not, who was not raised by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. And she managed to achieve the status of being nominated, the youngest person ever to be nominated for the Nobel Prize for Peace. Now imagine about Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam, a lady who's from her birth, she was born in the house of prophethood, in the house of message. The prophet is feeding her with knowledge, with ilm. So what we expect of her, you know, of such an individual. So it's not uncommon to see individuals who sometimes at a young age study, they memorize the Quran. At a young age, for example, they become scholars. Um, so, and they, these people are ordinary. Now when you're talking about Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam, who herself is an extraordinary woman, she's raised in an extraordinary house and with an, uh, the, the greatest of Allah's creation, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, it's no surprise to see that she had all the knowledge that she had and she achieved and accomplished all that she's accomplished. We also see her as the leader, we are told she is the leader of the women of the world. Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, sometimes when you look at her life and uh, the example of her being a woman, um, we don't, uh, w women sometimes get confused because they are not examples of uh, what you would call in the modern world women's liberation. So you don't see Lady Fatima speaking out, um, going out of the house. We are always encouraged that she was, you know, tending to her children, cooking food, which kind of does not work with the modern day woman. How can a modern day woman who is out doing, you know, work relate to Lady Fatima as her leader? Fatima salamullahi alayha, she used to teach, yes, in her house, she would not go out, but she had people who would come to her house and learn. There's an incident narrated in history about this lady who came and asked her a question, then asked her a second question, a third question, and after a few questions, she told Fatima salamullahi alayha, I feel that I'm burdening you with my questions. She replied saying that if a person is told to carry a heavy load to the roof of a building, but in exchange he will be given a huge reward, he would not be thinking about the burden of the load. He'd be thinking about the hefty reward. And this is the similitude of you asking me question, the reward for those who answer questions and help those who are in need they, it's so great that one would oversee the load of, uh, the burden of the load. So that indicates that people used to come to her, that's one. Two, Hadith al-Kisa is taught to us through Fatima al-Zahra alayha salam to Jabir ibn Abdullah al-Ansari. When you read Hadith al-Kisa, it says that from Jabir ibn Abdullah al-Ansari, from Fatima salam Allah alayha, which means she dictated or she told him the hadith of Kisa. This indicates, according to some fuqaha, some of our ulama say, based on this, it is permissible for women to talk to men who are strangers. But within the realm of professionalism, she was not sitting down having coffee with him, joking with him, not at all. She was teaching him, educating Jabir. We have incidents of her teaching Salman, al-Farisi or al-Muhammadi, radwanullahi ta'ala alayhi. So she did interact to, with the society, but within the boundaries of the Sharia, where the, she's not mingling among the men, she's not really taking out of the context of the house of prophethood. That's one. And then when the time came, the necessity came for her to leave the house, she did. After the Prophet's death, Amir al-Mu'mineen, Salamullah Ali Ali ibn Abi Talib, was in a difficult situation. He could not speak out loud in public. He used to go and ask for his right, but he was unable to give an entire sermon 
because that would have been life-threatening for him. They would have killed him. But she was able to do so because she's the Prophet's daughter and she's a woman. So she seized that opportunity and she delivered that perfect and great sermon in the Prophet's mosque. The Prophet's mosque was the platform for a public speech. The platform, it's like, for example, having the, the, the news channels that we have today. It was that public forum. She went there, although she asked for a cover, a curtain to be um, set, and she spoke from behind the curtain. But she delivered that power sermon known as the Sermon of Fadak, al khutbatul Fadakiyya. So she did also go out. In addition to this, she was, if we may call, use the word loosely, and I say loosely uh, um, for a reason, she was campaigning for Imam Ali alayhi, after the Prophet's death. She used to go knocking the doors of the people. Why don't you fulfill the allegiance that you pledged to my husband, Ali ibn Abi Talib? She was reminding the Muslims of their obligation, their right. She was trying to save Islam because she knew the deviation that is occurring. And if she could not stop it, then it will result in some real severe consequences. Unfortunately, what we see today happening. She tried to stop this, so she did her best. So she was involved politically. She was involved in the academics, in the knowledge and the education. So she was heavily involved in the society. We cannot say that she was outside, but within the boundaries of the Sharia, maintaining her integrity, her hijab. Would you say that there were also other cultural factors at that time, which probably are not applicable? So for example, when we say she would not leave the house until there was a need, that was more related to the culture of the time as opposed to the culture, because some of the women then get different messages or um, there's a confusion between men and women about when women should come out of the house and when not, and when there is a need and when there is no need. You know, I would be hesitant to say it's a cultural issue. The teachings of Ahlul Bayt are not cultural. The teachings of Ahlul Bayt are examples. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, and the example of the Prophet is a role model. So I cannot say that just because the Prophet lived in that culture, he behaved in that way. But rather, the Quran is telling me, no, he is a role model. So even if I'm in Canada, the way the Prophet sat is the way I should sit. Even if I'm in the UK, the way the Prophet ate, I should eat. The way he interacted with people is how I should interact, because he's a role model. The same would apply to Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam. So we need to take a look at that context. These are infallibles. These are the ma'sumin whom Allah has given to us as guides. If we start to give labels that this is culture and therefore she behaved in this manner, then we risk taking the context of the religion out of it and, and we start to interpret. It's understandable, of course, they lived at that particular time, but we also have to realize that given the circumstances that they were living in, this is how they behaved and this is how they interacted. We have 14 ma'sumin alayhim uh, salam 12 imams alayhim salam Sometimes to the similar or uh, a similar situation, they would respond differently. Imam al-Hassan gave a peace treaty. Imam al-Hussein was in a revolution. We can't say he is better than his brother because he fought and he got killed, not at all. Imam al-Hassan saved Islam through his peace. Imam al-Hussein saved Islam through the revolution. Imam al-Hassan used to live uh, to show the greatness of Islam. So he lives what we, again, I, I, lose the, I use the term very loosely, a luxurious life. Partly because maybe he wanted to show the Muslims that, listen, if you follow us, Ahlul Bayt, we also have dunya. Not just Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan has dunya, has money, has wealth. We also have it. So look at us, but we also have Akhira. We are the masters of the youth of Jannah. On the contrary, Imam Hussein lived a very simple life, modest life. His house was a modest house. You know, He showed what we call the humbleness of Islam, the modesty of Islam. Imam al-Hassan showed the integrity and the greatness of Islam. Imam al-Ridha was a sultan, you know, salam Allah He became the second man in the state, you know, although by force, but nonetheless, on the outside, he was the second man in the state. Whereas, for example, you find Imam al-Sajjad living also a modest life. Does that mean Imam al-Sajjad is better than Imam al-Ridha? Of course not, you know, these are all Imams, but to different circumstances, they reacted differently. 
that yes we can study that context of the circumstance of the history and then we react accordingly but we cannot just say that their reactions was out of a culture okay but rather it is how Allah ordered them to behave and interact and that's why they're role models for us okay and a final question um, she's such a great personality and there's so much uh, for both men and women to learn from her Unfortunately, sometimes we feel that there's very little we know about the life of Lady Fatima. Um, would you suggest any kind of reading or uh, sources that people can read up to know more about her? Um, there are several books of history. In English, uh, a good one may be Kitabul Irshad by Sheikh Mufid. It talks about the lives of the Imams, alayhim salam, but one can also have some understanding there. There is also Kitabul Amali by Sheikh Al Mufid, which has also been translated in English. Both of those books are available in English. And then there are books about Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam. Fatima the Gracious, um, for example, by a person who was a Sunni and became a Shia, uh, Ode. And there is other books as well available that people can look up online about the history and the life of this noble lady. And interestingly, this lady is the only lady upon whom or after whom an entire dynasty was formed. The Fatimid dynasty is named after Fatima al Zahra and they established Al Azhar University from Az Zahra, Salam Allahi alayha. That's not many people know. So she is such a great lady where a whole state or a dynasty was named. Of course that does not give her any merit. It does not mean that she's but it's interesting that she is a lady to have a dynasty named after a lady. That's something interesting to mention. Thank you very much, Sheikh Osama. And uh, thank you for watching. And if you have any questions or any to topics that you would like us to discuss with Sheikh Osama, please do email it to us. Thank you very much. <laughs>